Hello, I'm Jerry Shin. I'm here to talk to you about Jurassic Park, the media, where it's gone from there. Uh, I'm actually a field geologist, and I do some paleontology work on the side. Most paleontologists aren't paid very well to do their work. They do other things uh, in order to pay the checks, and a lot of them work at universities, but most of them actually do uh, other jobs and are amateurs. Uh, they do have find most of the new finds, uh, get the process started when we're actually looking for fossils. Um, I get out and see stuff a little bit, and I pretty much work in the field all the time. That's where I am, and it's probably my favorite occupation, uh, being a field geologist. So, Jurassic Park. I guess we're starting with a novel, and we'll start from there. Uh, it's Michael Crichton. Uh, the idea that he started with took place in the early 80s. Uh, he read some articles about possibly cloning uh, pterosaur, other animals, and working on a story behind that, but didn't get very far. And uh, in the late 80s and beginning of 90, uh, he actually got to work on a better treatment, uh, came up with the idea of a park, and uh, got going from there. Um, Michael Crichton actually is really good at looking at kind of the edge of science, where it's going to go next and what we're going to do from there. Uh, you look at the Andromeda strain, things coming back from space, possibly something going on. We're learning more about life on Venus, possibly, other things out there too. So it'll be kind of interesting to see where that goes, uh, if we find anything from that and how soon. Um, but uh, cloning got to be a big idea uh, in the 80s and early 90s. Um, took off from there, and we're starting to see it happening in other things. They closed the clone Dolly the Sheep to begin with, uh, and got going from there. Um, dinosaurs. The premise of the book is that they're actually taking uh, DNA from mosquitoes that have been trapped in amber, or possibly other insects too, that have been trapped in amber, bitten other animals at the time. Um, Dinosaur DNA is not preserved well in insects and most other animals, too. Uh, mosquito DNA disappeared, but we're not really excited about cloning mosquitoes. Um, working from there, uh, the premise was that they would pull DNA from mosquitoes, enhance it a little bit for what is missing, because it doesn't store well over long periods of time. It doesn't work well pulling something from 165 million years ago to now. Um, most dinosaur DNA that's best preserved is in the bones. Uh, the original thought was that the bones don't preserve much material, much of the original material, and the more we dig into them and study what's going on, we actually find that lots of genetic material is preserved in the bones themselves. And even further back, geologic history. Um, and one of the ironies here, Jurassic Park, um, is that most of the dinosaurs that you see are from the Cretaceous. <laughs> Some actually come from the Triassic too, So, but Jurassic Park just sounds cooler, so that's why they went with it. Um, but going back to the book, uh, we see John Hammond has an idea for producing a amusement park, game park, that sort of thing, featuring dinosaurs, because who wouldn't want to go see dinosaurs? Who wouldn't want to go see what was going on? Everybody would pay well to go see that. Um, and keeping them safe, the challenge there would be putting them somewhere remote, and they come up with the idea of putting them on an island off of Costa Rica. And that seems to work pretty well, but as you can see, the novel starts they're plainly getting onto ships or other ways and sinking on shore and causing general problems. So uh, they actually have some people who've been attacked and one baby was killed in the book by that. Uh, they don't include that portion in the movie. It's probably a little graphic for that. And there are several other things from the book that they leave out in the movie, uh, the initial one. But uh, so they send some samples off to analysis to university. Uh, they get uh, Alan Brandt involved, a uh, paleontologist in Montana, who's very much based on uh, an acquaintance of mine, uh, uh, Jack Horner. Um, 
other characters in there are based on similar people, but that's the predominant one. Uh, and his assistant, Ellie Sadler, is a grad student. Um, so they get pulled in by Mr. Hammond to come down and preview the park without really telling them what's going on. It's just a, uh, a game park. And they get there, along with Ian Malcolm, and review what's happening in the park. Um, and things don't necessarily go well. Uh, Hammond's grandchildren are there, and you see the ages reversed between the book and the film. You get uh, uh, Lexi, or Lex, who is uh, younger in the novel, is older in the film, uh, but also equally brilliant, although you can expect that with the upbringing they have, too. Um, but uh, um, Tour of the Park starts with very much like the film. Uh, you get Ian Malcolm, who's a mathematician, although he particularly specializes in chaos theory, which is something that turns up a little in geology, but not too much. We like everything cut and dry, nice and clear. There's always some of that involved in the work. Um, but Ian Malcolm, again, fascinated by the dinosaurs that appear. Uh, the grandkids are too, but we don't, when the tour starts, we don't see a lot of dinosaurs. They have to bring them out. Um, Dilophosaurus isn't even shown, uh, although it appears later on. And they throw something new in because we don't have any preservation of the materials that would show a fan or a display from Dilophosaurus, but they can speculate that there was one there. And also that it uh, produced venom, which also doesn't show up in the fossil record. Uh, but many of the other dinosaurs, we have information they do. Um, new things that have changed since then. Uh, we have dinosaur skin showing up. Uh, it gets preserved in various places. We actually have had hadrosaurs uh, that we find fossils of mummified hackersaurs. So we get a lot more information on that too. A uh, big challenge right now is learning about dinosaur organs and body systems. You know, what we're seeing from that. So they kind of touch on that in the idea here in the beginning, but then just go crazy with it with cloning dinosaurs. Um, as far as the possibility of closing dino cloning dinosaurs, um, everybody says, oh, in five years we'll do this. In five years we'll clone really mammals in five years we'll clone this and it always seems to be a little more out of reach eventually we'll probably be able to do something like that whether it's a good idea we'll see somebody's going to do it anyway when it eventually happens <laughs> somebody will find an isolated place and just jump on it uh, I don't know how soon that's going to happen and it may or may not be a good idea but we'll find out um, but as the novel progresses just like in the film things go bad die, <laughs> as has been predicted. Uh, Dr. Malcolm started with the whole process that the park's going to fail, and it seems to be a very simple security system, not too complex, not lots of redundancies or backups, and, and Dennis Nedry, of course, overrides them and makes a mess of the whole thing, so it doesn't go well with that, um, and ends up lost and paying the price for that, too, uh, and innocent people die in here, too. That tends to go on. And we could probably expect that from dinosaurs. Um, large predators, small predators, there's plenty of plant eaters there too. Uh, there are cases where there seems to be too many predators in the fossil record, but that has more to do with the odds of preservation versus what the population was actually like. Uh, some Body sizes and shapes are more likely to be preserved under particular conditions than others, and it just works out that way. Uh, several fossil sites out uh, at, for instance, the Bone, bone Cabin Quarry uh, in Wyoming is almost entirely uh, sauropods. Um, lots of plant-eating dinosaurs, and I know of one person who turned up a tooth. So, <laughs> but we'll see what goes on from there. But, um, so back to the book, uh, it's, as you can see, it develops as you go through, it's a cautionary tale. Uh, don't mess too far in science, uh, much like Frankenstein, uh, science will come back and bite you if you're not careful with it. And the same thing with 
bringing in something with the media like in King Kong and you know, we've got something really spectacular we bring back and make lots of money show the audience and you lose control of it and that's kind of the, the lesson in here too in either way with science or with the circus that, become, that comes around it so um, I don't my notes here too but lots of things developed from the original book uh, Steven Spielberg had early access to a draft of the novel and got started on a film that was sort of developed during and after the production of the novel. And, uh, did a movie from that, Jurassic Park, mostly based on the novel. They made some adjustments, a little less than Grizzly, um, a little more audience friendly, uh, especially for the ratings they wanted it. And then uh, Michael Creighton went on and wrote uh, The Lost World, Jurassic Park, and the uh, second Jurassic Park film was roughly based on that again, too. Idea of going out and capturing dinosaurs and taking advantage of them when Mr. Hammond isn't there to direct the process. So, and then from there, there weren't any more novels done, but then we went on into films Jurassic Park 3, Jurassic World. Uh, we got the next one is Fallen Kingdom, which is out, and then Jurassic World Dominion isn't due out until sometime next year. So, we'll see how that progresses. COVID going on, what else happens with it. Uh, but it's quite the media empire. There's also video games, there's graphic novels, there's animated series that have come out of it, and it builds pretty well. Um, it's one of the most successful media empires that are out there, too, and it also has an influence back on the field of paleontology. Um, a lot of the, the newest paleontological work is done by people who were inspired by the novel Jurassic Park and by the films. We had a large rush of younger people coming in, uh, getting excited about doing paleontological field work and building from there. And so lots of new PhDs out there are there because of Jurassic Park. And a lot more scholarship is getting done. We're learning a lot more about the field in general. Um, but you're not going to get rich being a paleontologist. People think you do, but again, you have to do some other work while you do that. Uh, historically, uh, paleontology, for the most part, is a relatively new field uh, with good understanding of what was going on. Uh, the big stuff, especially in North America, got started in the late 1800s. Uh, O.C. Marsh and uh, uh, Edward Cope were independently wealthy, so they could afford to go out and do whatever work they wanted, and we don't see that too much with uh, other people today have to have a lot of sponsorship, or you have to have a job doing something else where you can take time off and go out and do field work and rely on amateurs who can go out and find the material too, like a picture before. So, and then build on your scholarship from there. So, uh, some of the other things I've got here too. Um, most of the characters in there are fairly realistic people. Uh, Dr. Malcolm is based again on a mathematician who was a little more of a rock star. There are people in there who aren't quite, um, like Dr. Wu is very much interested in doing the science. Let's do the science, let's see if this is possible. Get out and do it without considering any after effects or consequences, but that's not his job in there particularly. Um, again, Dennis Nedry sets up the safety in computer systems, doesn't necessarily do the best job, is in it for the money. Um, and then Lewis Dodgson, who's from a competing company, Again, is trying to get samples of the dinosaurs that he threw over that are there so they can work with them and find a way to make some money off of cloning them too. So because it's cloning is a fairly new field as far as the book is concerned and they want to make some money off of it and get some from it. Um, but, uh, let's see. So that's just kind of a rough outline of where we are, what's going on. Um, a lot of what you see in Jurassic Park is either on the edge of fiction, uh, possibilities, things that have changed dominantly in the field after Jurassic Park came out. We've learned a lot of dinosaurs. There's always been, for some time, this link between dinosaurs and birds, and it keeps getting closer and closer as we find more about it. We're not sure at what point dinosaurs and birds diverged. 
possibilities get keep pushing further and further back in geologic time. Feathers are the biggest thing to come out of that. We're finding more and more information about dinosaurs with feathers and where they came from and what happened with them. And just as a background, feathers have a lot in common with scales. Um, and there's a period where scales got very long and narrow. And there's some questions on whether they morphed over into feathers because they're warmer for protection. They allow for more movement. Um, but you don't see that much in scales, which are more for protection and armor. Uh, and as they became less important, as dinosaurs became more mobile, uh, we would see more of that happen. Uh, but there's, we don't have enough information yet with fossils to do that. And we don't have enough cloning <laughs> to go on to actually grow them and see what's happening. But as time progresses, we'll find out more about this. So, uh, but that's the biggest change. We find out more about the dinosaurs, basic systems, but the most profound thing we've seen is feathers. And we knew that dinosaurs would begin into that, and Steven Spielberg went to Jack Horner and talked to him about it. And he actually said to Jack, he said, basically, you tell me what they look like, I'll make them do what I want. Because it seems highly unlikely that T-Rex would attack in, you know, a, a car. <laughs> versus a goat that's standing there, or a beet, or a sick T-Rex, or a triceratops that you go after. So we don't see too much of that very often in the film. But uh, they do like eating people, which act like game. <laughs> so don't run, hide, don't move. That's what you're getting from T-Rex. Um, and that's true with many predators, but not all of them. Uh, and there's, again, the big debate, which still isn't answered, whether it was more a predator or a scavenger. And, Personally, I think it's an opportunist. Uh, it went after whatever it could catch. Uh, if it was, there was convenient meal lying there, it would eat that. If it could run something down, it would eat that. And that's much more likely than what I'm seeing. So, uh, I think that's about it for today. Let's see how we're looking there. And if you have any questions, I'm recording this, so I don't, I'm again out in the field. I have terrible signal. I'm going to have to drive into town to transmit this. See how that goes. But if you have any questions or anything you want to know, both with Jurassic Park and with paleontology or pretty much anything else, uh, get a hold of the people there and they'll send me an email or message and I will do my best to get back to you. Uh, thank you for your time and I will talk to you later. Bye.